They want time to stand still. They are Old Colony Mennonites, a Protestant sect that traces its roots back 400 years to Central Europe. Now they're scattered throughout the world, but they swear allegiance to no flag, only to the Bibles they carry. There are 50,000 Mennonites in this community in northern Mexico near the Texas border. They came here 70 years ago from Canada. They left because they felt their way of life was being threatened by the Canadian government, which demanded they teach English in their schools. Here, they're left alone, isolating themselves from worldly things they believe are evil. They live a simple, austere life, working the desert until it blooms. This is a song about those Mennonite farmers who came to Cuauhtémoc 70 years ago. It says their self-reliance, discipline, and hard work has brought prosperity not only to Mennonites, but to Mexicans as well. The Mennonites who came here to Cuauhtémoc trekked a long way to escape Canadian society. Whole villages were transplanted to Mexican soil. Just down the road from here, there is a settlement called Swift Current, but that is the only thing it has in common with its namesake in Saskatchewan. Just 20 years ago, this community paid the local utility not to deliver electricity here. But the strict old colony Mennonites couldn't keep the world at bay for long. Slowly, they accepted modern trappings like electricity, like mechanized farming equipment. They even took a vote and grudgingly allowed a phone booth to be installed. Now the new and the old exist side by side, but not easily. And then, she says it was incredibly dry here at the times that they were here. But, but things grew well over here. Helen Dick was 22 years old when she came to Cuauhtémoc from Manitoba. When visitors from Canada drop by, this 90-year-old matriarch loves to reminisce about the old days. But she also worries about what is going to happen to her 12 children and 60 grandchildren as Mennonite ways change. No one believes in God anymore. The young kids just chase around and have accidents. She says the youth drinks a lot. I thought, I thought Mennonites didn't do that. They didn't drink. <laughs> Sunday church service is over and the sermon is already forgotten. This isn't just sneaking a few sips of beer and whiskey behind the barn. These boys are openly drunk. <laughs> Alcoholism and all the problems that go with it is now a fact of life in this community. Abraham Berg, an old colony political leader, remembers when Mennonites were not allowed to use rubber wheels and encouraged them to stay on the farm in the community. Now Berg says he can't always keep his people in, nor can he keep the world out. One can't say it changes for the better, more for the worse. You have a lot of problems. Yeah, that's, that's trouble means. There are a lot of problems. A lot of people don't have land and don't have work to do. And without land or work, some people around here have been forced to sell off their possessions just to make ends meet. Many are leaving Cuauhtémoc and moving to the country their parents left behind. 20,000 Mexican Mennonites have already come to Ontario alone to reclaim their Canadian citizenship. A few of those have chosen a fast track back to a better life. Family ties between Mennonites in Mexico and those in Canada run very deep. Most every Mennonite in Manitoba and Ontario has some relative here, and they love to visit usually driving steadily for three or four days through Mexico and the United States. And for years, customs inspectors looked into the vehicle, saw Mennonites, and just waved them across the border. 
Michael LaPay is in charge of customs in El Paso, Texas. This man doesn't trust anyone. He once inspected a baby's diapers looking for drugs. But even he was surprised with the idea of a Mennonite drug connection. I was shocked uh, to think that a, 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 a member, a person who was a member of a, a religious organization as tried and true as Mennonites would smuggle dope. But then, as I've mentioned many times before, after a while it just sinks in and you think nothing's sacred anymore. How inventive, how clever are these people? We've had cases where people have smuggled drugs in cheese wheels. Cheese wheels? Wheels of cheese that are covered and shipped. We found dope in those, in the wheels. You know, they tend to be cloaked with a, uh, a veneer of uh, law-abiding citizens, and it, it tend to throw you off guard. But we are not thrown off guard. We're looking now. We're looking very closely. And what they found wasn't just one or two guys with a few bricks of marijuana under the car seat. They discovered a network of Mennonites holding both Mexican and Canadian passports. The trail starts in Cuauhtémoc, with marijuana coming from South America and Mexico. It's driven over the border at crossings in Texas and New Mexico, and then up through the United States. The drugs end up in Manitoba and southwestern Ontario. But first, they have to sneak past Canadian customs. Jim Johnson, Drugs and Intelligence Officer in Windsor, Ontario, says these people are pros. I think that they're organized. I think they're organized very well. Uh, I think there's a lot of money to be made in it, and I think uh, that uh, they're very good at it. How long do you think this has been going on? I wouldn't be adverse to say uh, 10 years at least, and, you know, probably longer. 10 years, probably longer? Boy, you guys were asleep at the switch. I guess we were, yeah. The person who woke them up was Abraham Harms, a Mennonite farmer from Cuauhtémoc, Mexico, living in Wheatley, Ontario. Harms was nabbed in an undercover sting operation in 1989. He was caught with 14 kilos of marijuana worth a quarter of a million dollars. The light went on, a Mennonite with marijuana. Canadian Customs and the Ontario Provincial Police started to take a much closer look at what was coming across the border in Windsor. Two undercover agents have spent the last couple of years tracking Mennonite drug smugglers. How much of the, the drugs that come across the, the bridge from the United States would you say is Mennonite? Could you put a pound figure, a, a dollar uh, figure? Approximately 20% of what comes across yeah. Mennonite. 20%? Mm -hmm. And that represents what in dollars, street value? I would say it's easy millions of dollars. Yeah. And there is a very large profit margin here. Marijuana that is bought for $25 a kilo from Mexican growers sells for more than $3,000 in Canada wholesale. It's a sophisticated smuggling operation. The mules, the couriers who bring the drugs across the border, use vehicles with specially made compartments. They have a lookout system and they often change cars en route. Police and customs agents have identified five Mennonite drug cells operating in southwestern Ontario. They involve up to 100 people, many of them in the same family. They are becoming more educated, becoming involved with different criminal elements, and the introduction of weapons has started on a small scale. They're organized. Um, there seems to be a hierarchy within the organization. You are talking about organized crime, a Mennonite mob? <laughs> I guess you could put it that way, yes. It turned out that Abe Harms, the Wheatley farmer who was arrested back in 89 on drug charges, was a key figure in this mob. Harms had a nearly perfect front. He used farmhouses in southwestern Ontario to stash drugs and money. Harms recruited Mennonites like Franz Schmidt, who had just arrived from Mexico. Schmidt had three kids and not a penny to his name. Harms made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I had no money, I couldn't work in that time, and I need money to buy groceries. So he said, are you going to give me a couple hundred dollars so to just to keep it at home, at home here? Schmidt got $320 from Harms and a month in jail. But Abraham Harms, who was out on $10,000 bail, didn't stick around. Like other Mexican Mennonites, his dual citizenship allowed him convenient cross-border hopping to avoid prosecution. Back in Mexico, Harms sent his two sons across the border to El Paso. Before they got there, the Mexican police stopped them. Hidden in secret compartments in the truck was 41 kilos of marijuana. 
His boys went to jail, but again, Harms walked away. He is near the top. He is near the top. Two or three, and maybe position number two or three. Where is Abe Harms? Best of my knowledge, he's in Mexico. Even though Abe Harms is in Mexico, I do believe that his cell is still active here in Canada. And Abe Harms himself is yes. still active, we believe. You just moved head office? Yes. His new head office is in Cuauhtémoc, in one of the poorest Mennonite communities in the area. Most people here trace their roots back to southwestern Ontario. This is where we found Abraham Harms. Hello, Mr. Harms? Yeah, okay. Hello, I'm Hannah Gartner, Canadian Television. Okay. I think I was, you can interview him in English. Yes, I was talking to... Uh, I was, no, don't speak to me too much English. I'll talk slowly. I was speaking to Canadian... Uh, Police and they told me that you are involved in the drug business here in Cuauhtémoc. No, not me. No? No. Are you retired? No, I never do hear that. Well, that's not true at all, Mr. Harms. You're a fugitive from Canada on narcotics charges, possession and trafficking of marijuana. The customs official and the police mm -hmm. are very anxious to have you. Could I ask you one question, just as a parent? How can you make your children act as mules and smuggle narcotics across the border? As a parent, I would like to know this. I don't understand you. Are you going back to Canada to face charges? No, I don't know. Maybe not you. So you admit that you are in the drug business? You're staring at me, sir, but you're not answering. Harms claims he's out of the drug business. Whatever he's doing, it's going well. Harms is building a new wing that's even bigger than the original house. So how's he making his money now to do all this, uh, this work? With the uh, making of furniture. They do good business with furniture now. Is that your son behind us in the purple cap? Is this the boy? Yeah. I thought you said he's not home. I think you do understand that you have made criminals out of your children. I think you do understand that. Yeah, I can't understand. Yes, I do understand. Cerezo Prison in Juarez, Mexico. Harm's 20-year-old son, Enrique, is still in jail. His friend is Abe Reimer, also a Mennonite from Quatomic. Both were caught smuggling drugs. Both claimed they were set up. Harm's by his father, Reimer by friends. It's the first time either of them has been in prison, and they say they've learned a lesson from all this. Don't ever trust anyone again. I would like to know what you're going to tell your father when you get out of here. I want to answer that by, by a, the drugs will come in the truck. And... He's going to clear up why they set, a, set up the truck with the drugs and sent him and his brother. And he still hasn't told you that? After you pop it, it's out, it's out. What takes over in a community that fathers set up their kids and friends set up their buddies to smuggle drugs? I would say it has to do the money. More and more people want money. They don't care much more about friends, nor families, nor anything that they got. They're just after the money. What has this done to the Mennonite community in Cuauhtémoc? I would say it has disgraced them a lot. Those people, they always try to be the, the best and the honest, but uh, as time goes by, it changes. Some things don't change. In this one-room schoolhouse, devotion and education are the same. Boys are required to go to school only until they're 14, and girls until they're 12. 
they learned to read from a Bible written in Gothic German. It's been that way for hundreds of years, and they want it to stay that way. Some Mennonite leaders, like Abraham Berg, are finding it hard to accept that their people are not immune to the problems that face any other community. Is there a shame for you that some Mennonites are giving your community a bad name? We couldn't believe it when we heard there was an organized group that was working from here. These are people within your community. How is it that you permit the situation to exist? We don't allow it. Sunday after Sunday, the ministers preach against it, warn the people. But we can't keep it under control anymore because the people do not believe anymore. There have been people in this community who have been excommunicated for far less than drugs. You? You're attacking the problem by preaching from the pulpit on Sundays. Is it perhaps time for more radical solutions? That's what I look like. It is time to do something, but nothing will work as long as the peso is so powerful and can buy people off, even the police. They are involved too. That's why it's so difficult. And it doesn't help that the exploits of the drug smugglers are being celebrated on the Mexican hit parade. This is a tale of two mythical Mennonites from hell who have a bloody shootout with police at the border. The song isn't that far-fetched. American customs officials recently launched Operation Piñata, an investigation into Mennonite drug trafficking and money laundering. In the last 10 months, 24 Mennonites, most of them Canadians, have been arrested at border points in Texas, New Mexico, and Ontario. A total seizure of almost $2 million worth of marijuana. While the drugs are moving north, the profits are moving south to the kingpins of the organization. Police may be closer to identifying them after a major bust at the Juarez-El Paso border crossing. They check everyone here. So when two pickup trucks with Manitoba license plates drive across from Mexico on November 23rd, 1989, it was just another inspection. Until a dog sniffing a car for drugs in this lane suddenly jumped over to the two pickup trucks and went crazy. The dogs headed right for the pickups and showed particular interest in the two Chesterfields in the back. Customs inspectors pulled the unusually heavy couches off the trucks and split them open. Packed tightly inside was 108 kilos of marijuana securely wrapped in plastic and tape. And there was more stuffed inside the walls of the truck. It was a haul worth $1.5 million. Driving one of the trucks was Cornelius Banman, a 54-year-old Mennonite cattle farmer from Manitoba. He told customs agents the trucks were both his and that the other driver had nothing to do with it. The Americans charged Banman with drug smuggling and released him on $120,000 bail. All charges against the other driver, Abe Fraze, were dropped. Although Fraze had driven with Banman back and forth to Mexico for years, he claims he never once suspected he was carrying drugs. You had no idea what you were hauling? No. You didn't know that you were smuggling drugs? No, no, I had no idea about that. They found marijuana stuffed into the walls of the, of the truck, in the cab. You didn't smell it? No, it was, uh, see, he always uh, bought a lot of those Mexican deodorizers for the vehicles. The Mennonite Church in Winkler, Manitoba, welcomed Cornelius Banman back into the fold, even though he's a wanted man. He didn't wait around for a trial in the United States. He jumped bail and ran home to his farm in Ganandathol, Manitoba. Banman may have gotten away, but he is not free. For two years, American authorities have been trying to get him back. Now Banman says he's out of money and he's sick of fighting extradition. He's decided to go back to the United States to stand trial, and the only person he wants to talk to is the judge. He's now prepared to point the finger at his source. Banman says the drugs planted in the trucks that he and Abraham Fraze were driving came from the Lowen family of Cuauhtamoc, Mexico. No matter where the dust flies in Cuauhtamoc, some of it is bound to fall on something owned by the Lowens. They operate dozens of businesses here, farm machinery, fabric stores, pharmacies, and restaurants. 
This is one of their homes with a lake and cottage right in the backyard. It's more new money than old colony. Humberto Ramos is a former mayor and now a businessman in Cuauhtémoc. He knows the Lowens and he knows what people are saying about them. I know some people who are known drug dealers, but it is too delicate to name names. What can you tell me about the Lowens? Estas familias, estoy de acuerdo que son muy prósperas. They are very prosperous. I know them very well, and I know that they're on the suspect's list. But I can't assure you 100% that's the reason they are so rich. <coughs> Brothers Cornelius and Geraldo Lowen are two of the clan. They own El Gordo, the fat one, one of the biggest machinery operations in Cuauhtémoc. They say this business has made them rich. They're big men in the Mennonite community, contributing money to the orphanage, donating materials for local school construction. But the austere Mennonite way of life clearly doesn't appeal to them. This does not uh, seem like a Mennonite house. It's very fancy. Five bathrooms? Pues no, no todos. Viven así no más que otros. Pues nosotros hemos viajado mucho por los Estados Unidos y hemos visto casas así bonitas. Y queríamos hacer una parecida a ellas. Pero pues yo, bueno, no sé, pero yo creo que, que el que podría hacerla, yo creo que la haría. O sea, pues que el, el que tuviera dinero y manera de hacerla, pues yo creo que sí la haría. Are you very rich? No. You, are, you didn't need translation for that one. <laughs> Perhaps their most profitable venture is their little mall on the main highway. It's a favorite shopping spot for both local and visiting Mennonites. And remember those two Chesterfields with the marijuana stuffing? Bandman and Frey say they loaded them onto the pickups right out of the Lowen's furniture store. You see this man, Bandman, this man Frey, you know these people? No me acuerdo yo. This man says he knows you very well, he knows you for a long time, and he says that you offered him $30,000 to smuggle drugs across the border to Denver and then to Canada. Yo creo que ni yo ni mi hermano si tuviéramos $30,000 en efectivo, yo creo que no hubiera necesidad de ponerlos en riesgo. Recognize this Chesterfield? This Chesterfield comes from your brother's store. 238 pounds of marijuana were pulled out of it. Y pues no niego que lo haya comprado ahí en la mueblería, pero yo lo que sí le aseguro que, que ahí no lo cargaron. Ni siquiera la, yo ni siquiera conozco la marihuana, no sé ni cómo es. You know, the police and customs officials in the United States and in Canada describe the drug trade that is coming out of Cuauhtomic as organized crime. They say it's a, a Mennonite mob. And they think that you are the brains behind the operation. Have the Mexican police come here to ask you the same sorts of questions I'm asking you? No. No, no han venido porque nosotros conocemos muchísima gente y yo creo que en un dado caso que sospecharan alguna cosa de nosotros o que creyeran, nosotros tenemos muchos amigos que podían respaldarnos. Ellos saben que no, que no hacemos ese tipo de trabajo. I guess it's naive of me to think that you're going to say, yes, Hannah, we're drug smugglers. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think that, for the most part, they're very confident. They're a very confident organization, and uh, in spite of the setbacks they've had or the interceptions they've had, that they're just as confident with their uh, system uh, now as they were uh, a year ago. Does the Mennonite community understand that there's organized crime on their doorstep? Being a, a very small element of the overall Mennonite community, I don't know whether they even realize uh, the impact that it, that it has on, uh, in this particular area. I wish the elders or someone within the community that would come forward and give us a hand on this, but as of this date, no, it's been very, very limited. Did you find for a long time you were just closing your eyes to the problem that was facing you? At first, we didn't do anything about it because we were hoping it was a dream. But finally, we had to realize that this wasn't a dream. This was a reality. It just didn't go away. So we had to just open our eyes. Can you foresee a time when the Mennonites here in Mexico will do what they did in Canada in 1922, pick up and look for a place that's safer? Is there such a place? 
If there was a place that would offer the security, then we would do it, but there is no such place. It's late winter in the Kwaktemuk Valley, time for scorching the fields. For Mennonites, the land has always meant prosperity and security. But for the Mennonites of Kwaktemuk, security has become elusive. <laughs> 